It's easy to get lost. This is The Revenue Maze, and I'm Valerie Cobb. Join me as we navigate the halls, dead ends, and U-turns on your path towards upward growth trajectory. The Revenue Maze is sponsored by Revenue North Star, guidance and execution through fractional revenue leadership, uncovering hidden revenues, and empowering small business growth through process-driven sales customized to your company environment. Well, welcome everybody. I'm super excited to have you on the show today. I have an amazing guest and I've been waiting for this one because I'm I'm super excited about him. He has more than 30 years. We're not going to calculate it. More More than 30 years executive experience in the engineering and operations management manufacturing space. He also, and I, this is hard, he's ASQ trained Six Sigma black belt and executive champion. We'll talk more about champion. And he was on the executive team that launched the red digital camera in the entertainment and film space. And that is a very big deal. We'll talk about that too. This is exciting today. And he transitioned to something that's really, really cool. He is the CEO at Medwand, and we'll get into that story a little bit today, too. So I'm super excited about that. But welcome, Robert Rose. Thank you, Valerie. (laughs) My pleasure to be here. (laughs) I I have just always, I, I just love these stories. And I think that is one of the funnest thing about being a podcast host is I get to hear about all these great things. And we're going to learn even more about you. Um, But we always start the show with one thing. What is one thing that you can tell the listeners that will help them get out of the revenue maze? One thing. (laughs) There's then so you can build up bullet points on how to fix it. <laughs> right, right, yeah, it's, just, it's just so easy. I just, just uh, I think the most important lesson that, that we can learn as, as leaders of companies is to uh, kind of abandon your, your preconceptions of things, listen to the voice of your customer and be ready to pivot because it, what you think is going to happen isn't. And uh, you, you need to be listening and paying attention. If you listen to what your customers want, you, you've got a good chance of succeeding. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, you know, there's been a few that, it, listen, why do we need to keep being reminded of this? So it must be incredibly difficult. I'm in revenue. So I know it's, it's very difficult. Sometimes we get very myopic. So Give us a few pointers on how you've act, actually navigated that. How are you, how can you help us listen better? <laughs> I, I think if you're going to be successful, there, there's only three real value propositions, you know, on earth, right? It, it's uh, uh, the, the um, uh, customer intimacy, uh, price, or operational excellence. And you got to be perfect at one, really good at a second, and the third one, you don't have to worry about too much. And we can take any company that's successful in revenue generation and attribute one of those as their, their leading mantra. Uh, I mean, I'll look at Intel's a good example, or, or Microsoft as being uh, technological leaders. Uh, from a customer intimate standpoint, you know, you're, you're talking about delighting a customer. Uh, you know, Starbucks, I think, kind of goes that way. Why else would we pay five dollars for a cup of coffee, right? Um, so, exactly. and, and, then, and then there's price, and 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 price is uh, okay. If you're lowest price, you you may generate more revenue, but you got to make it up in volume. Um, so uh, you need to know what you're good at, and sure. and and stay that way. Uh, for me personally, um, my successes have been more focused on new and unique technology, uh, something that like Red Digital, where we invented the 4K camera, uh, we obsoleted film, uh, you know. And, <laughs> All that little stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, you know, and, and we did. And, and um, the, uh, that, that was, it was a great run. Um, back in the day, I was with uh, Tandy, um, Radio Shack Systems Integration back when Michael Dell was starting to uh, make build-to-order computers. Well, 
Mm -hmm. We had a great infrastructure. We could do it faster as well as he could do it. And we had a great market. But you have to understand where the market need is and be able to fill that. Um, and if, if you've got a compelling product and a, and a good market, uh, you know, then go out and be the very best you can on one of those value propositions. And uh, you should be able to sell stuff, but you also have to be, you know, you talk about generating revenue. It's, it's not just about revenue. It's about operational excellence. You, you can't, you can't be uh, large, onerous and sloppy in everything that you do. You have a great product, but if you lose $2 on every one that you ship, you can't make it up in volume. So <laughs> <laughs> then you're, well, not so much a nonprofit, right? <laughs> <laughs> But even a nonprofit has to has to garner funding, you know, and eventually yes, somebody's exactly. gonna say, hey, I'm sorry, it's enough is enough of this, right? So you you do have to be be operationally excellent. And that's where the six sigma stuff comes in, is that uh, you know, being able to be focused on continuous improvement uh, and and the voice of the customer, uh, the rest of it tends to work itself out. You know, I, I love that basically you described to me a three-legged stool, you know, and yeah, one of them has to be really, 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 really done well. And I have noticed I, there's a few people recently, it, the life cycle of companies sometimes is that they're not so well in one of those areas and then they pick it up, you know, because I recently, it used to be that Microsoft was awful with tech support for small business oh, yeah. and now they are like rocking tech support like i can get them as fast on the line as well hubspot and that's like in two seconds right so it's it's been they've kind of done a really amazing turn and then when you started kind of mentioning some of those being the forerunner in in some of those areas listening to the voice of the customer helps you do that, right? I mean, that, that's that's the whole point. If you're in a pre-emerging market, then it's much easier than if you're trying to compete head on. Yeah, I, I have a great example of this, of uh, having, like most of us, uh, traveled extensively throughout my career. Uh, back in the day when, when America West flew out of uh, Phoenix primarily uh, in the Southwest, uh, they, had one of the best call center operations in the industry, in the airline industry. You knew if you called America West for a reservation or for a problem, they were on the phone just like that. And whoever answered spoke English and uh, was actually likely in Phoenix where their call centers were located as you know, part of their company. If you tried to call some other airlines, <laughs> like <laughs> okay, um, it, it was, you know, you, you're going to wait on hold for an hour, an hour and a half. And, and uh, the, um, the level of service caused me to want to fly America West because I knew that, I mean, an airplane is an airplane and okay, it's, uh, they're not that much different once you get on board. But the whole process of getting there and, and consumers speak with their wallets in that regard. So uh, it's, it's important that, again, listen to the voice of customer internally, you've got to, you've got to look at why the phone rings. Um, and uh, I, I took over a computer company uh, that was losing a ton of money back in uh, um, two, 2000. Um, <laughs> You were one of the insane. I won't name them, but but I was <laughs> I was brought in to do a turnaround, and yeah. um, they had. And I spent the first few days before I ever went to their factory just looking at the books, and it was like, okay, why do you have all these people in your call center? And that means, and and then looking at the call center metrics, their their speed to answer was being measured in hours instead of seconds, mm -hmm. and uh, their first pass resolution was poor, and uh, you you've because they weren't focused on why the phone rang and what it was the customers were calling about. The, the more you, again, this goes back to the voice of the customer, but it's not just about the product you're providing, but it's the backend services that you're providing. So that when your customer calls you, uh, you can resolve the problem instantly. Uh, from a revenue standpoint, that sells more stuff. From an mm -hmm. operational standpoint, it costs less money. So you, you, uh, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but you have to introduce in the manufacturing space, your engineering group to your 
call center group to your manufacturing group to your quality group and make it a closed loop. Yes. And, and too often companies leave that loop open somewhere. And, yep. uh, and it's always the customer that ends up suffering in the end because you can't, you can't close that, uh, a problem, um, <clears throat> and, or answer a question that, that might be, uh, uh, germane in somebody making a decision on, on a purchase, particularly a major purchase on an expensive product. So, uh, you know, those, are, those are all, <laughs> There isn't one thing, Valerie. That, yeah, that, exactly. That, we that, can that, talk, that, that, but but there there are certain basic uh, uh, disciplines that you've got to master if, if you're going to have uh, predictable revenue and, and successful uh, successful operations. And then I think the last piece of that, or to just carry it a little bit further, as a an executive or as a manager, is you, you got to look at the P and L and manage by P and L. Look where the money's going, and 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 look for those hidden profit leaks. And usually, when you kick a rock and find a pop, pop, uh, profit leak underneath, um, you're also going to find a customer service problem because you're spending money on something you shouldn't be. And and uh, you know, so to, to my mind, revenue goes both ways. It's what's coming in, but it's also what's going out and what you keep based on how well you run your company. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have a different dialogue, but there's the whole uh, thought process of what is a CRO versus a VP of sales. And we'll do that offline, but it, <laughs> it is talking about somewhat of that closing that loop. And, and um, there is misunderstanding, obviously, in, in that realm as well. But I love what you're saying. And I, I like I said, I was super excited to have you on my show simply because I love your journey right? Your journey and what you've done, what you're doing and how you're moving forward. So I know that some of this was brought from a little bit of life experience. So let's go back a little bit. What kind of brought you to this point, right? What, what kind of, if there was like maybe, and maybe it's too difficult to pinpoint, but a pivotal moment in your life that's, that kind of went, this is my journey. This is where I'm going. Yeah, other than sheer dumb luck. Um, and, and, <laughs> and getting, Dang, can you rub my shoulder? <laughs> getting, and, get, and getting sold, you know, I feel like sometimes like fish, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been in enough companies that have been sold that, that uh, it's kind of been a story of my life as well. But uh, I think when, gosh, a pivotal moment was probably... Uh, let's go back to about 1994. And I was working for a company in South Florida that made uh, onboard entertainment systems for commercial aircraft. Okay. And our, our company was sold um, to Northrop. And I found myself in South Florida without a job. And it wasn't exactly the um, bastion of, uh, of technology down there at the time. <laughs> Probably not being, doesn't like being in Silicon Valley, you know. So, um, <clears throat> I uh, I knew uh, some key people in, in a Tandy organization, and I got on the phone. I started like dialing for dollars. Said, "Hey, you know, I really need a job here." And uh, long story short, I I ended up taking a job with uh, with Tandy to take over a uh, uh, service center in um, a brand new computer city store in Georgia. I took a 50% pay cut to do this, right? Mm -hmm. But I had, a, I had a secret mission and that was uh, from, from the, uh, my boss in, in Fort Worth at Tandy. And that was, you know, these service centers do okay in the computer city stores, but we're looking for ways to enhance our revenue, okay? Yeah. So how do you do that? And we just want you to go in and take a look and we know your history a little bit. Uh, and, and see if you can find new ways uh, to uh, cause these uh, service centers to become uh, more profit centers. I mean, the store is what it is and it just sells what it sells. So this is where a uh, brand new store, two or three months, uh, one of the salespeople uh, in the corporate sales group came over and said, the Weather Channel would like to have a whole bunch of these computers. They, they were just down the street from us. And uh, they want... Uh, but they want it. They're different than anything we have in here. Can you guys build those for them? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure we can. We got all the parts we need out there. It just we'll build you the you know. So that started us building, doing build to order computers in that little store in Smyrna, Georgia. And it, within six months, we'd grown a business that was expected to do a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in service work to a couple of million dollars a year pace in build to order as we started offering it through our corporate sales side. And then we expanded to some of the other stores. And then one day, the VP of uh, uh, Tandy Retail Services walked into my little service center. He came all the way out from Fort Worth and said, we need to go to lunch. And uh, <laughs> so we did. And uh, <clears throat> one of the great mentors in my career, by the way, his name is Bob McClure. And uh, uh, Bob said, uh, this is great. Uh, I've got 1,500 Radio Shack franchise stores, <laughs> uh, the incredible universe chain, and all of the computer city chains that, that need uh, to have these services. And I've got an empty building out in Hazel, Texas, and it's yours. You're now group general manager of uh, Tandy Systems Integration. Pick the people you want, move to Fort Worth, please, tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that, that's a true story. And 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 I did. And, and I took most of my team with me out of that little store and we built a factory and we were doing $30 million in business by, you know, six months down the road. And it, it kind of snowballed from there as far as my career is concerned, because a year or so later, um, Tandy sold the computer city stores to CompUSA. And wow. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> looked, looked at what we were doing and, and wanted our factory and our build to order capabilities as part of the deal. Uh -huh. And uh, what came out of that was CompUSA PC. <laughs> and all, yeah. of us, all of us went to CompUSA. And, uh, and my core team, uh, and we stayed with CompUSA until it was sold to uh, Carlos Slim. And we saw, uh, it's Telmex in Mexico, and we, we saw the uh, writing on the wall for that. and. And from there, I ended up being a global vice president of operations for Wiley Systems. And I was, I was there until uh, Wiley was sold um, to Arrow. And then uh, <laughs> I went on to do that recovery mission and uh, the Lex computer company. And it, it just kind of escalated my career as we went. But along the way, you know, I became a student of Jack Welsh and Six Sigma and started to see what, what, uh, what it meant to uh, to be operationally excellent, and uh, <laughs> I decided that a lot of people paid lip service to, to Six Sigma, but I couldn't bring it into a company and do it right unless I understood it myself. And yeah, uh, so I went through the ASQ training and became a black belt and uh, say executive champion, which is not quite even being a black belt, but just endorsing it but uh, driving an entire Six Sigma initiative, uh, more than one company from the top down. And, wow. and, it, and it worked. Um, and anyway, uh, more recently, it's been a little different. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it is certainly a, a, an amazing story when we, when we talk about those things. Because, yeah, I mean, I, when I go into companies, I, I, do, I always do what I was taught now is called high involvement planning to to create that excellence loop every single year for forecasting out so um but i am not six sigma and i've always i've read up on it and i've met people and i'm like they are just the sharpest people <laughs> i should probably i should probably do that anyways but well that's a yeah but story. be careful because you can mess that up too yeah, so, probably. It, it, yeah, I know we we've met people along the way who like Kaizen events, you know, they'll they'll do they'll do Kaizen events for the sake of doing them. Okay. And I yeah. I don't need people from six different departments, including the janitor, telling me how I should organize my desk. Right? <laughs> exactly. And, and it can get that ridiculous. <laughs> and, and so you you have to take everything with with a modicum of of um, common sense common right? sense and, and, and yes. moderation in what you're doing and just don't become a zealot about anything but but uh yeah. be able to look at a much bigger picture <laughs> yeah and and when it gets down to it i think there was a linkedin post talking about common sense that gut reaction and emotion you know and there's some things in there that it, it's just very very interesting so no it, it's a cool story so 
I know that there later on in this show, we'll talk a little bit more about just you personally. I hear some little bit of Olympics and track and this kind of stuff. So you must have been a high achiever at all times uh, and in all places and on all things. Um, but, you know, did that take you then what finally took you to the journey of med wand? Why do you, why do you switch to healthcare? Cause I've been in healthcare too, and there's different reasons why I've done that, but why are you, why are, why, why the switch? <laughs> Remember when I said pure dumb luck, um, I, I, uh, I actually started my career in healthcare. When I got out of college, uh, mm -hmm. my, my very first job was uh, as a production control manager for uh, a medical equipment company. In, uh, okay. And uh, so I have a bit of a background in it. And uh, then I went into consumer electronics and the rest of the, uh, the history that you heard uh, up through red. But uh, it's how I got into this was really was an accident. Uh, I, when I left Red, I started my own uh, contract engineering company, and okay. I had several engineers that were at Red and some other people that I knew, and we saw a need for, especially here in Southern California, for a uh, uh, kind of a different kind of contract engineering company, and, and one of my uh, engineers had been a senior scientist at Massimo. Um, another guy who's a medical equipment designer on the hardware side of things. Uh, so I had a lot of talent there and we did several different projects early in uh, that company, which was called Cypher Scientific, which still exists in it, only it's wholly owned by MedOne now. Um, mm -hmm. But, but it, uh, it was uh, a vibrant lifestyle company that did kind of medical equipment and it was kind of cool. And then uh, the, you need to transition into how Medwan started, at least in order to finish the story. But, but uh, okay. I, I had, uh, I knew a doctor in, in uh, Las Vegas and he, he and I knew each other for some other business. And we were talking one day and he had no idea that I had an engineering company. Uh, he was a direct primary care physician. And he asked me what I did. And I said, well, you know, I've got an engineering company and we do like, you know, some some uh, medical equipment and, and different different projects and we have a lot of fun. I said, "Oh, I've got this great idea." My sister called me from Chicago the other day and she had an upper respiratory problem. And I tried to auscultate her lungs with a cell phone and it, like it didn't work out too good. <laughs> so oh. I would I would love and this was a night this was in uh, two thousand uh, a long time ago. Uh, we started the company. This would have been uh, twenty fourteen. Um, he uh, he said, I'd love to have a device where I could just like take basic vitals like I do in my office, but over the internet. And so, I, yeah, I think we could build that. And, and uh, you know, he got any money and he was like, no. And said, <laughs> of course <"Okay."> not. <laughs> <laughs> not that kind of money anyway. I said, but, but um, uh, I, I think it's a great idea. So why don't we partner up? You're a doctor, I'm an engineer, all we need is a lawyer and we're all set. And, and uh, so we made we made a company and we called it Medwan Solutions. And then we spent the next two, three years going out and trying to fund it. And, and we did, uh, we got MIT Angels uh, uh, interested and that's where our first funding came from. There's a lot more to this story as you want me to tell it, but uh, <laughs> the but that's, that's how it started. But what we started with uh, eight years ago and where we are at today is a completely uh -huh. different place. And that's because when you talk about listening to the voice of your customers, sure. um, you know, the pandemic helped a lot in, in propelling uh, telehealth 10 years into the future in about 20 months. But, uh, but at the same time, so technology has, has evolved as well. So what started out as a product idea for something that could be used by a doctor to examine a patient remotely has turned into an entire platform and an ecosystem that's now a platform for AI and for other devices and, and a lot more. And, and it's a, because it had to, uh, and we couldn't have one without the other. Yeah. So, you know, here we are. Uh, I would add to that, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to, to do well by doing good. And we're gonna have a big effect on people as we move forward and, and, and the healthcare uh, uh, in the landscape in general. Uh, I, 
guess Tori filled you in on what we've done at the Smithsonian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just got back from a week at, at the Smithsonian and we were honored by the, the, um, the Futures exhibition going on at Smithsonian Arts and Industries building since last November uh -huh. as, as the future of healthcare. I mean, and, and, and the, the, the recognition and the reception that we've gotten along the way has just been so gratifying. Oh, wow. That's so, awesome. you know, to, to see, you, know, you, you ask why I've done this. Well, I think it's why I've become I said you shouldn't do it. What a zealot, or uh, so much more, more passionate about what we're doing now than anything I've done in my career, and and that's because we're in a field that needs help. Oh uh, yes, it know. does. And the delivery of healthcare <laughs> around the world is 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 a mess. And you know, if you've got a lot of money, it's okay, I suppose. But um, you know, we talk about health equity, and you know, there's there's billions of people uh, that there's no health care at all, let alone health equity, yeah. um, you know, but, but 60 million people here in the United States live more than a, uh, a half an hour drive to the nearest health care facility. So, um, you know, you, you, you find a need that is, uh, you know, really, really needs solutions. Uh, we can't boil the ocean and solve everything, but uh, maybe together we can and, and our small part of it uh, is important. And, and so I, I chose to abandon the rest of what we were doing with Cypher Scientific and, and move my team and everything else 100% uh, into MedWand and, and expand our, uh, our footprint, if you will, uh, to an entire ecosystem that could really make a difference, not just the toy or a product or a wearable that we might sell and you know, uh, make a little bit of money from. But, but something that, that, that could help. And when you get up in the morning knowing that, it, it makes it all worthwhile. So. <laughs> I, I love it. it. You know, it's, 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 you know, about the entire wellness. I, I, I quite often, you know, when you say luck and stuff like that, I, I was only in healthcare for a short time. I've been in a lot of different industries. And one of the things that I really did find is two things. One, someone I really love to this day because of how she was, right? And I'm gonna shout her out because I like shouting people out on the show, but her name's Gail <laughs> Lindsay. And she was with the group um, that kind of was pioneering Kaiser Permanente's preventative care campaigns and things like that, that they were doing, especially along some areas that she and I had some symbiotic fam family relations that had issues in, you know, and, and stuff like that. But mo more than that, she just is a person who practiced what she preached in it. You know, there's a lot of that fee for service stuff going around and, and that's right. You, yeah. there's a lot of people who, um, they don't need the God complex. They need somebody who holistically looks at them and sees them as an individual that isn't a tooth, isn't an ear, isn't a eye, isn't a, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I, I remember talking at the time um, at Highmark and just talking with, um, oh, my brain just went blank. But anyways, we were talking about the holistic approach for that. And um, I just, I felt like in that healthcare in all its blustering, you know, we get here, Humana's bold gold and all of that kind of stuff is very antiquated and they stay behind the times because they don't move forward in some things, right? Some things they are just like, so on it, kind of like I, I was in heavy equipment, you know? the trucks were all shined, right? They were great, but the digital stuff is like way, way behind in, in, in that area. And, and we worked on some things that was operational excellence, um, just more to get more reach to those who could have social determinants, different things, just to work that way, you know? And so uh -huh. I really, felt like that was a very gratifying time in my life for sure so yeah i know yeah. what you mean and, and um 
we we look at in, in the medical space today, uh, we're, we're trying to push a transition away from fee for service yeah. uh, on coin operated doctors, right? Uh, <laughs> to to outcome, uh, out, outcome based uh, redu- you know, uh, reimbursement models that, um, uh, you know, uh, the um, Medicare has done a fairly good job of motivating hospitals to. Uh, Modify their their post uh, admission or their their you know readmissions yeah, yeah readmission stuff because they're fine for readmissions and while <laughs> it's it's still kind of a fee for service bay where or it's 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 a coin operated approach but but it does affect the outcome and devices like ours uh, can start to level the playing field and when you talk about social determinants of health well you know that's that's Exactly. Level and, and access and, uh, and and all of that. It's it's a it, it's a big hill to climb. But uh, you know, okay. <laughs> I, I had right. another and, group yeah. tell me. We'll, we'll take it. I, Climate. One of my, <laughs> one of my uh, uh, members of my advisory board um, has a company that uh, you know, here's a guy who doesn't need to work right. And but yet he's just totally motivated to do the right things or good things. And so he figured, well, what am I going to do next in my life? Let me take on some small thing like <laughs> opioid addiction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Let's just he take went that off on. And, yeah, and figured out that um, uh, by using VR, um, they could modify uh, behavior and affect those uh, pain receptors in the brain in the same way that an opioid could and has had incredible results at reducing uh, addictions and dependencies on opioids. There's stuff that we can do. We just have to, you know, have the will to, <laughs> to take it on and, and, and not let the status quo stop us. You know, I, I've got to I tell my people all the time, you can never stop or they will catch you. <laughs> you know, and uh, so yeah. you know, we, we just keep pushing. And 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 um, if if your motivation is to do good things, then then I, I think, you know, you talk about this is this is a, all about revenue, right? Uh, the revenue maze sorts itself out. If if you can do what we've been talking about, which is to to listen to your customer and find a place that, where there's a need, mm-hmm. and be operationally a, excellent, the revenue takes care of itself, and or it should. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I 100%, you know, because I've been on the revenue side, my, I, whether I wanted to or not, for some reason, my entire life, and I love it. I do. I love the the thrill of seeing things grow and seeing jobs created and then, you know, the whole the widget is sometimes the most, the most exciting part, but the other part is just seeing that somebody has the ability to excel. That's, that's what I get off on. My, <clears throat> my, my kids always say your love language is service mom. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, it is because I like to see people, you know, growing and being able to make it. And I like these small businesses to definitely make it because they have some very, they've listened to the customer and the customer has kind of said, there's, here's this need. And we talk about that all the time, even in like in, when I train sales teams, you know, we talk about stop selling. Well, how do you stop selling? Well, really Daniel Pink says to sell is human. How about stop trying to manipulate and just look for a need and fill the need because once you feel that need, then the value is already there. So it, it's the same circular sort of way of looking at it. And sometimes we get so focused on, well, did you get your numbers this month? And I trust me, I'm very numbers oriented, <laughs> everything. I, but then there's the emotional aspect that kind of goes up with that. So, um, uh, and your gut reaction too. Yeah, I, I think there's a bifurcation between the, you talk about the CRO versus, uh, you know, the VP sales. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, but one is, one is strategic. When, when you look at a revenue officer or, uh, 
what, what direction is the company going? And, and you're trying to identify those, those areas where there, there is a need. Okay, now I've identified a need. I'm going to pass it off to this guy because you're going to figure out how to make that work. And, and, and then um, the, uh, the tactical execution of sales. Yeah. Um, also not <clears throat> or recognizing when you're in the wrong place. And also knowing not to sell past the close. Okay, it's good enough. You know, we got it. <laughs> and, and and be obnoxious about it. And, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, I I, um, I I think sometimes those things get confused a little bit, particularly in smaller companies, because mm -hmm. uh, you you have a, a VP of sales and marketing who's uh, trying to think strategically or execute strategically and at the same time has to support the tactical execution of stuff and you know is down in the minutiae of things. I work through <laughs> that now. I, I don't have that many people. And, and so, you know, it's, um, yeah, the, I, the producer player does not quite work very well. I mean, we, yeah. we, we can get into that one completely. And I, I didn't, I mean to make us so that we digress because I want you back on Medwand and some of the excellence that you have achieved. I mean, this, you know, it's great to go out to the Smithsonian. As we start to think of, okay, you can do good. You can make money and do good. Okay, great. So I hear that you have always done excellence, whether it's been in, um, just sitting it, it whether it's been in growing those companies or whatever but track in the olympics does oh, actually, that ring a bell <laughs> actually, actually wasn't it wasn't track um, it wasn't track okay okay no, tori you're fired <laughs> no, 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 no. It was, i'm just teasing right her. About that. I, I was uh <laughs> no i i was uh one of the non-Olympians from 1980 because we we boycotted that year. It didn't get to go, but oh, but, but um, I'm an athlete. I, I I'm a fencer. So um, and I've been fencing. I started fencing. Fencing. Oh, yeah. okay. Maybe I miswrote it. I'm as, sorry. You know, as in like with a sword. I yeah. I, uh, I started fencing in in uh, my first year of college, and I found out that I was really good at this. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and pretty soon I was I was nationally ranked, and I actually had a had a talent for it. And I continued to fence up in, into my early fifties. Um, wow. But I had my knees replaced. But uh, <laughs> even and even now, I'd like to get back out on the strip. But I, I just have been so busy; it could only do so many things. You know, I, I have uh, I'm also a pilot, and I have I have a race car, and I, you know, I, I keep really really busy. So she um, listed those things. I was like, yeah, no yeah, way. And, and, <laughs> but, but I've also, you know, you. you I've also been fired and, and, you know, I, I've had, I've had financial stress in my life too. And I've always managed to fall uphill because you just keep going, you know, and, and do the best you can. And uh, part of it's luck and part of it's just perseverance. You just have to keep on it and keep on it and keep on it. And things don't always work out. Um, I remember before, um, uh, I went to red, I was doing some consulting work for a couple of years and I ended up in, in a little office in a company in New Jersey, dialing for dial, dollars, trying to, you know, bring in as a sales guy, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> I, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> traveling back and forth to my home in Las Vegas. And, um, you know, so I've done a couple startups that I've been involved in, but didn't start that have failed and, you know, Oh, okay. Now what? So, uh, <laughs> it, you know, I'm, I'm in this group uh, called, ABL here in Southern California is adaptive business leaders and it's uh, okay. C-level level round tables. Sure. And we have both technology round tables and healthcare round tables. And I'm one of the healthcare round tables. And this came up just the last couple of months in one of our meetings that I just asked the question, how many people in here have been fired more than once? Every <laughs> hand went up, okay? <laughs> yeah. uh, if, if you haven't been fired, you aren't pushing hard enough. Right? I, exactly. You know? and, and eventually... <laughs> Eventually, you're going to rattle somebody's cage, and you're going to get yourself in trouble. And and, <laughs> and and you know, to hear some of the stories, and you know, I'm talking about also in the room, the CEO of of uh, a major healthcare company whose name you would recognize um, said, "Oh yeah, I got fired three times from that." You know, and it's like because <laughs> because that's what we do, right? But but <laughs> it's it, it just you don't have to. 
everybody is not going to end up where I did. I said, some of it's been by, by luck, you know, some of it's been by planning, but, but if you can be the best at what, uh, or try your best, it's going to get recognized and, and you can go a long way. Uh, you know, I, I've learned that, um, to surround yourself with a great team and, you know, let them run. Uh, if you've got the right people, you don't have to micromanage them. I, I look at my job and I always have, whether I've been a division manager or I've been, you know, CEO is as a, uh, more like a conductor of a symphony orchestra. I can't play any of those instruments as well as any of those guys can, but I can <laughs> all play together perfectly. And, 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 and that's, that's really, uh, a recipe for, uh, I think, for success for a company, uh, yeah. you know, in a fast company. I also had a, a, another boss who just passed away, who, who uh, <clears throat> another great mentor of mine, his name was Rob Howe. And uh, Rob always had the saying that um, if your senior staff can't fit in a minivan, you have too many people. <laughs> so, uh, I love that. <laughs> but if you, you with duct tape on coat. the door yeah right, right. <laughs> so and not a clown car minivan but you you have to you have to be able to uh, to to surround yourself with with the right key people and, and let them do their jobs and and uh, you don't always succeed at that with everybody but on on balance the team works well together if you got a bad apple it doesn't stay very long anyway so you know and uh, that's Again, from from navigating the revenue maze, uh, <laughs> having the right having the right team, understanding how all the parts fit together uh, is is, uh, is really critical. So, yeah. I've been pretty good at that uh, over the years. Uh, I I can't take credit for everything. I I can only uh, just to wax philosophic for a minute. But I, I have had some great mentors in my career and you take the time to listen and now all of a sudden you know I, I've realized in the last couple of years as, as this journey's gone on that all of a sudden I'm them and <laughs> I, people were coming to me with it as like now I got to sit down and go gosh what would Rob do you know or, or, or what would Bob McClure say about this because because I've got to come up with an answer here <laughs> you know, so I put together this great advisory board of people who I just respect tremendously who have, have wide and varied uh, experiences inside of, uh, of, of the medical um, business in general, but um, specifically in different silos, uh, to act as advisors and, and listen to them. And, and we had an advisory board meeting this morning, and I got a whole list of stuff here on my desk I didn't even think of. You know, yeah. And, and that you, you got, you know, we got two of these and one of these for a reason. And, and listen twice as much as you speak it should do okay. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's fantastic. And it's great advice because we have up and coming generations that are also trying to build new things to help solve needs. And so I love listen twice as much as you talk. <laughs> that is true. I love that you're talking about it. And I love the humility portion of it because. Well, let me talk about what you just touched on, which is my millennials. <laughs> First of all, if, and, and I have several working for me, you already know Tori, and I, I've got, I don't know, four or five in our little company here. Yeah. And, and they, and I'll have many more as time goes on. I was going to say, um, you're going to have, yeah, because <laughs> you're going to have the next gen. <laughs> but, but, but they have, they have a different perspective than the one I came up with and, and, and a different view of life. Uh, they, they've grown up with a, a where, where I have an intense expectation of privacy. They have no expectation of privacy. They live their <laughs> lives out. You know, live their lives out. Well, you're, come on, you're a podcaster. You know this. They live their lives out, out on social networking. And, but, but they understand what, what's going on in the world and what people think. And they're smart. And, and they care. And they care about different things. They don't care as much about doing better than their parents did, like you know, I, I grew up with. And that they care more about fixing stuff, you know, and, and yeah. doing the right things. And along the way, they, they also know how to have some fun and, and um, <laughs> they, they don't, they're not as structured as we were. And um, they're, uh, you know, 
they're brilliant. And I have found that, that the millennials we have here in the company um, are, or Gen X or Z. Or, I was going to say they're whatever Pew Research uh, tier we're on at this point coming up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, 20 year olds, 30 year olds are, are um, uh, 20 something or 30 something, uh, add so much more dimension to our company but we have to stop and listen to them and have to be very, very careful not to tick them off because they, they, they you know, I can't say you've got to be here from nine to five. You know, those, those days don't exist for those guys. No. Uh, they, no. They'll get the job done. They'll work 20 hours if they need to. They'll work three if they need to. And, and you, you just have to trust them um, if you have the, you know, the right ones. But from what I know of the young people that at least work for me, I think we're in really good hands for the future. So, you know, at least I'm hoping, um, you know, it's hopeful. That's, that's, you know, I, and I wouldn't have talked about this, but I had a life lesson last week and, and it isn't that I didn't have a life lesson, but, you know, within your own family, sometimes mm -hmm. you forget to listen to your family members, you know, or whatever it is. And my daughter was getting married last week and it wasn't as structured and it wasn't all the pomp and circumstance. And what you just described, I was just right before we started this show, I was just describing to somebody the beauty of that event. Now, this is, we do not even have the same faith background, right? This is my own daughter and we don't even have the same faith background. And she is such a giver and she's so peaceful with it. And so she wanted to have this wedding of 24 people. That was it. And I, I honored that, but here's the difference. She also wanted to have the two families actually blend and merge so we were together for three solid days mm. for this wedding and after they got married and they came back from their honeymoon the night you know or whatever they didn't go on their honeymoon right straight from there the next day the two families all we did was play we did acro gymnastics and yes I am in that range where that's scary and I had to go get a massage on my shoulder from yet another 30 year old who said, why were you doing that and laughed? But at the end of the day, I learned that something that I learned clear back in college, I was over some kind of event and there was differences of opinion on how that event should have happened. And so they went with my way of doing huge success. The next year they went with the other guy's way of doing huge success. and. Um, and that wedding created a memory. Weddings are supposed to be fun and exciting. And it's a celebration. And a lot of times it just, it hasn't been, you know? And as we went through this experience with her, cause it was an experience, it was so much better than I could have ever thought it could have been. So when you're talking about letting them run with good ideas and not necessarily gone are the days of saying, you know, clock in, do this. It's really project-based. It's really, here's the project, get it done. If you work 60 hours on it, great. If you work 50 hours, 40, whatever you do on it, the project needs done. It's done. <laughs> you know, we don't need to, we don't need to do that. And so I was so glad you brought that up. Thank you. Uh, they, they won't Quite welcome. I, I think that again, a, a, if you're going to be successful in business, uh, <clears throat> you got these are some of the lessons you have to learn, and, and you've got to let go of of the, some of the status quo ideas and structure that we came up with. We're in a different world now, so. Uh, but but there's there's still you know still important things to do. It, you know, the, one of the questions I know that one was you know what excites me about the future. Um, this is part of it, but also what we're doing uh, at Medwan. Uh, the uh, last spring, uh, <laughs> my my father-in-law uh, uh, died of a, a massive stroke. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. And he was 84. Uh, but you know, he, 
what was unfortunate was he didn't need to have died. Um, when they took him to the hospital and they had him in ICU and he was on a 12 lead EKG, uh, the, the very sophisticated EKG, and it was indicating that he had AFib. Yeah. And uh, the um, AFib is, or stroke is the second largest killer of people in the world behind ischemic heart disease. Right behind that is COPD, both upper and lower respiratory. Uh, yeah. So Medwan has an EKG, a single channel EKG. And in our cloud-based platform, we have uh, an AI engine that can detect 16 different arrhythmias uh, with a single 30 second screening of EKG. 20% of all strokes are caused by undetected AFib. Yeah. Imagine the impact if everybody in the world could have a 30 second screening, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. See if they had undetected AFib on, on the millions and millions of people that are going to die between now and, and uh, you know, this time next year, uh, needlessly. And um, I, so <laughs> there's, there's so much to do um, and, and, and so many opportunities. And, and so this is one of the things that you talk about getting up in the morning and getting motivated. And also, well, yeah, motivating uh, your people is, is a you know, it's a key part of my job. Yeah. And you're, we, we talk about, you know, the millennials or the, the, the young people and how to get them and keep them motivated. One has to do with the work environment. The other has to do with doing good work. And uh, so I, I, I use that story a lot because, uh, you know, it's very personal to me that, that uh, you know, here's a case where had we finished this device two years ago uh, and not been delayed by COVID and the FDA, uh, <laughs> that uh, um, we, uh, we, we might have saved my father-in-law's life, you know, and, and uh, Medwan uh, detected a, a heart arrhythmia in, in me uh, when it first came online. My vice president of sales found out he had that uh, tachycardia uh, that was being induced by caffeine. He was drinking too much coffee and his heart was racing. He didn't know it. Um, you know, so, so, uh, and we haven't even started shipping yet, you know, where we'll, we expect our final FDA clearance in the next few weeks and, and we'll be on the market this year. And, and, uh, but after eight years, we're just poised to do so much, right? Yeah. Um, Northrop visited with us at CES and, and they want to put uh, uh, that one on the International Space Station for a test in order to um, uh, go with our, our astronauts for a human deep space exploration and colonization of the moon and Mars. They look at, at devices like ours as, as key to the future. So, um, you know, just having come out of uh, uh, the Futures exhibition at the Smithsonian, uh, uh, it it's bright if we have the will to make it so, you know, yeah. it's screw up too, but I think there, there's, a, <laughs> <laughs> there's enough That's drive fine. out there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, um, yeah. I, I love that. So a lot of people, we talked a lot about Medwan. We, we talked about your story and that story is very compelling. It's, it's kind of what, when I was talking about Gail Lindsay and our symbiosis, we had some similar kind of thing. And I love that that drives. So if I'm summarizing, you know, listen, then make sure that you actually act in a, a good way to solve a need. And then from there, um, the future is quite bright. Mm -hmm. And so bringing this all full circle, a lot of people want to know, you're working on all these things. So what do you do for fun in your spare time? <laughs> or is this your only fun? And it is fun. Trust me. I, 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 business is fun for me. So. Oh, I, I love coming to work, but, but I, I work hard. I play hard. I, I guess my, my, my single passion outside of, of, of work that just takes me away is flying. And, you know, I'm, I'm a pilot. And, um, we have a little single engine airplane and, and um, it, it's to, to get up in the sky and uh, just 
we're not thinking about work there or you know, go cloud dancing or, or, you know, take a flight to somewhere, go look for whales or something. But um, <laughs> it, it's that that's one thing. And I mentioned I have a race car. So I, I have uh, I have a Corvette that I, I race um, just for fun, uh, you know, track day events, stuff like that. And I, I did win a Wellwood Corvette challenge a couple of years ago, but but um, it's the same thing on the track. It, you do things when, you, when you're behind the wheel of a car doing you know, high performance driving events. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not thinking about work. You're, nope. you've got to be focused <laughs> on that next corner coming up. And, and so, um, yeah, you could, you could sit home and, and think about work or you could go out and do something that takes, a, a, I think, a totally different um mindset and focus away from what you do and it causes for me it causes a balance so uh, you know it's kind of a work hard play hard thing although i do love to relax um i i've been studying to get a, a sommelier uh, uh um, certificate for, okay you know, for wine and stuff but but typically i you know, i like to travel although um, i wish i didn't have to travel as much as i do that I could like pick my destinations more than I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, but I keep busy. I, you know, I, it, it's, um, I see people who slow down and then they start aging really bad mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not interested in that. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to just keep busy and keep going and, uh, do it as long as I can. And, and, uh, so as long as I'm physically able and mentally able, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll you'll keep, keep <laughs> there, yeah. you'll keep doing race cars and and cloud dancing with your yeah, airplane. Right, right. <laughs> no wonder you you yeah. might have some heart arrhythmia. <laughs> you know, kind of. So, <laughs> you love uh, all the all the exciting things. That is that is fun. That is so much fun. Well, Bob, people want to know how they can get a hold of med wand with you know whatever because i already know i've i've taken a mental note because i already know several people that i want to talk to about med wand so how do they get a hold of you sure um first of all personally getting a hold of me is is fairly the easiest way to do that's through linkedin uh okay. the page you can look me up it's robert rose med wand you will find me uh, <laughs> Our website is medwand, M-E-D-W-A-N-D.com. Um, you'll find the profiles of all of our key people up there, uh, including my advisory board. And uh, uh, you, you can drop an email uh, request in the, in the uh, there's an e uh, email link there uh, that drops into an info box. And, and I, if it's addressed to me, I will get it. Okay. Um, and uh, I would encourage people to go take a look at our website anyway, because there's some really cool stuff up there. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh you know and, and follow us there's going to be uh uh we have a, we have uh twitter and and uh, uh the um you know all the, all the social networking sites <laughs> you, can find, you can find medwan there but if you go to our website you'll see all the links and okay. if you follow us on twitter uh you know when, when we do press releases and and big news happens uh, we will tweet it out and there's fixing to be big news here in the next few weeks and you know the the biggest news everybody's waiting for is our final fda clearance yeah so, yeah know, it's been a two and a half year journey since we filed our initial pre-sub with fda all 2400 pages of it and and <laughs> We've been going back and forth with you know, issues and, and questions and clarifications and additional clinical trials, all the things that FDA makes you do, yes. um, you know, as a class two medical device. And it, it's been uh, uh, it's, it's been an interesting experience getting an FDA approval for a device in the middle of a pandemic. So oh, I bet. Oh, yeah. so taking a little bit longer than we thought and a lot more. Uh, perseverance but we've gotten through it now and there's just lots of cool things that are going to start happening i'm looking forward to the rest of this year it's going to be dynamic i bet you there's going to be a big party in a couple of weeks <laughs> we're already looking at what we're going to do for that you know, <laughs> after eight years I, you know <laughs> no 
Oh, goodness. Well, all great things. Thank you so much, Bob, for being on the show. Everybody, this is Robert Rose. It was an amazing episode. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for the guests who are listening on this show. Drop him a line in a couple of weeks and show him your support. We really, really, uh, it's an exciting thing that he's doing. And just again, thank you so much, Bob, for being on the show. Thank you, Valerie. I've enjoyed it. Thank you all for joining another great episode. For show notes, links, and resources, visit revenuemaze.com. And never forget, you are why. 